All right. So this this morning I'm speaking about how to recover from emotional baggages. I'm going to speak about how to recover from emotional baggages. So so we're going to start with a simple thing. Why is it important to recover from one? Glory to God. It's going to start with that. But before we talk, talk about that, let me just tell you something. Um, in choosing, so I, I dedicated this service and I said I will speak to a lot of single people in this service. So all of you that are married, just know that um, for this month, we want to just speak into the single people. And the reason why I feel like say, that's the foundation place. So there's a place to, you know, there's just a place to really move on from there. So I want to speak to the single people. When you want to look for someone to marry, the Bible says something. It says a tree is known by his what? Huh? The challenge with single people is this. They don't look for fruits. They look for leaves. So you hear, oh, he's a, he's a great guy. He works in shell. That's not fruits. He didn't produce shell. Oh, he's a great lady. She comes from a good family. That's not fruits. You don't produce your family. He says a tree is known by its fruits. So when it comes to relationship, what you want to be concerned about, what is this person producing? What is this person producing? So you want to look at their character. You want to look at what they use with their time, what they've done with their life. <laughs> you know, someone says, she says in the Koyi, how is that a fruit? He drives a great car. That's, you know, the, you know, the fruit comes from within. Then someone says to me, because I just want to answer the questions that people are putting in my mind, you know, be, and I'll get into the teaching. He says, um, what's your advice about marrying a potential? Someone that has potentials to manifest. And I say, never marry a potential. Never. What should you marry? Marry patterns. Because potentials might never manifest. What is pattern? Potential is this. This is my dream. I hope to become this. That's potential. Pattern is, oh, when I had 10, I made it 12. It's small, but I progressed. When I had 12, I made it 15. It's small, but I progressed. When I had 15, I made it 18. You can see the pattern. So, it may not be a big deal, but the pattern of progress is what is obvious. The pattern of progress <coughs> sorry excuse me can i get some water the pattern of progress is obvious excuse me thank you the pattern of progress is obvious all right so let's go okay so let's get into the teaching today are we ready Okay, we're ready to get into teaching. We're ready to get into the teaching. Awesome. Let's turn up. <laughs> we're ready to get into teaching. Awesome. So, um, let, let me just say this for you. Second Corinthians chapter 1. I've started with all this today because that's a good place to start from. Chapter 3, um, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So, in this service, as we unpack how to deal with emotional issues, I just want you to understand the dynamics. Now, what is the purpose? The purpose of unpacking this is not for you to just vent. No, it's more than that. The purpose of unpacking emotional issues, especially for those of you that are single, is that we're hoping that you can come into wholeness. Can I get my plates? This is what, this is what, this is what it looks like. This is what the Bible calls marriage. The Bible says this about marriage. It says two people, shall, it says two shall become one. Yeah. It says two shall become one. So in God's marriage, it's two people. This is two whole people. Then what happens to them? They become one. But what happens to people is this. Most people are not whole. So what you have is that they have. But it didn't say two Two third, or two one quarter, or two three fifths will become one. He says, so people come into marriage hoping to have wholeness, and marriage itself doesn't mean marriage itself is whatever you put into it. So when a marriage is whole, it's because whole people became married. When a marriage is not whole, it's because not whole people became married. 
So the question is this. See, what we're trying to do is that if for any reason you are like this, we can get you to become like this. Because I think it's unfair, and this is what happens in a relationship, where a lady will be whole and date a guy that is on whole. And you, what, what happens is that you will begin to lynch on the other person. The best gift a single person can give to a partner or his partner is a whole you. And that whole you is something you have to do for yourself. Glory to God. That's what you have to do for yourself. So for all of us that are married here and you're wondering, okay, am I in the wrong service? I mean, God just brought you right on time. You know, I wish you came for the other services. But the question is this, and if you're married and you're finding that maybe I'm not whole, maybe, you know, because this, the thing in marriage is that most partners know what the other person needs to fix to get better. But most pastors don't know what they have to fix to get better. And you need to go back and say, and great marriages, this is how great marriages work. Everybody doesn't work on the other person. Everybody works on themselves. In great marriages, everybody works on what? On themselves. So my job is not to fix my partner. My job is what? To fix me. Because if I get better, my partner gets better. You know what? There's something about challenge. There's something about you getting better that challenges your partner to step up. I don't know if you have a group of friends where, you know, if you have a group of friends where they were all dating and all of those kind of things, you know, um, where they were all friends and one person bought a car and all of you did not have cars. And as soon as the person bought the car, what happens? Everybody in the group is going to aspire. One of the great things about relationship is this. If you step up, you can challenge your partner to step up. But what we want to do is to harass them to step up. Meanwhile, you can inspire them to step up by being the change you want. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. So let's read quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in verse 3 and 4. So he says that, I'm going to read the last line. He said, the God of all comfort. So this is the purpose of this teaching. He says, verse 4, Who comfort us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble. Someone says, how do I know if I've been healed? The way you know you've been healed is this, that the comfort you've received, you can comfort somebody else with it. So, if your tribulation still triggers you, if someone's trouble story still triggers you, then you're not healed. Because if you're healed, you have experienced comfort. So, when other people are talking, you can take out of the comfort that you have experienced and you can pass to them. Let me tell you what this means. So when your friend comes and tells you about how she had a terrible breakup, you don't say, hmm, men, they are all useless. No, 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 no. That's not what you say because you've been healed. Healed means you now have a different perspective. You don't say, oh, wow. You know, the truth is that I understand what you're talking about. But I've also seen God turn things around. And she wonder, why are you talking like that? But the reason why you're talking like that is because of something you've been through and you have been comforted so verse 4 says that who comfort us in all tribulation that we may be able to comfort them that are in trouble by the comfort whereby we have been comforted of God the way you know you've been healed is this and take note of this this is the way you know you've been healed the persons who are hurt and have dealt with it when others share their story what you have is compassion and comfort towards them the reason, see, what you have is, so when they share their stories, it doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you cry. No, as a matter of fact, what you have is like, oh wow, I understand what you're coming from. And your story is a soothing one because now it's, it's not triggering you. Rather, it's providing, you're providing comfort. And you're seeing their story through the eye of what? Compassion. So when someone has a failed marriage, if you say, ah, you've joined us, you've not been healed. Because your statement does not show compassion. If you've been healed, you'll be like, oh wow, I understand where you are. I understand what you're going through. As a matter of fact, these are the three phases you're dealing with right now. And this is what I think you should do because I've been there before. But see, what I see is that you can come out of this clearly. Glory to God. I say glory to God. I say glory to God. All right. So let's turn to, oh, this is so good. So this is so good. So why is it important for us to be healed? Hebrews chapter 12. This is one of the things I started with. 
Hebrews. Why is it important for us? The reason why is that I want to challenge everyone to a journey of wholeness, either in the marriage or either as a single person. I want to challenge you to a journey of wholeness. So Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 15. We're going to read some verses before that. Maybe I should make you turn into somewhere else before we do that. Because maybe a story will help us see this there. Glory to God. 2 Samuel chapter 13. Verse 20. And I want to give an example of how emotional baggages are carried. 2 Samuel chapter 13 verse 20. Let me give the background of the story. So David had all of those sons from sons and daughters from different wives so they were step siblings and all of those things but david's king um like a upper and what a guy called absalom absalom was meant to be the king i want to show you once you don't once you choose not to heal what you do to yourself so absalom was going to be the king but absalom had the stepbrother called amnon and amnon got confused and raped tamar a stepsister Amnon and Tamar were stepbrothers and sisters but Tamar was a direct sister to Absalom so when he raped him see what when he raped see what Absalom said Absalom a brother said unto her Tamar had Amnon thy brother been with thee raped thee and he says but now hold your peace my sister he is thy brother Regard not the thing he has done. So Tamar remained desolate in a brother's Absalom's house. Sometimes the pain, hurt, and emotional baggage you carry is not what you experienced. It was transferred to you. A lady was sharing a story with me and she shared the story, just, you know, sent a story from the UK and said, I watched the message and she said to me, he said, my father used to abuse my mom and physically beat her. He said, but it got to a time in the, in the crisis that he noticed that he not hurt my mom. So he noticed that hitting me hurt my mom. So when my parents had an argument, my father hit me. She became, she was not involved in that. But she began to receive that. And I'm saying so because some of you, You've not the reason why you have the baggage is not something that directly happened to you. You've just seen what happened between dad and mom, and you've made up your mind. And you know, you know, what, you know, one lady said, he said, what, what incident? He said, Man, he said, I, I will never do this to men. I'm like, which man has done this to you? He said, What my father did to my mother. But you didn't experience it as a as a wife. You must notice this. So when we talk about pain, we're not talking about even just what you experience. What you experience can cause you direct pain. Maybe you were raped as a person. Maybe you expressed rejection. Maybe you had experienced that, you know, destroyed your self-love. But see what the Bible says here. For Absalom, he didn't really express it directly. It was the influence of the sister that came on him. And see the next line. I want to see something. And, and you know, some people think pain goes with time. No, sir. With time, pain begins to have a voice. Oh, yes. I don't think pain goes with time. I think with time, pain begins to have a voice. See what the Bible says. The Bible says this. In verse 21, let's go now. The Bible says this. And when the king heard of it, and this was what was upsetting, because David heard of it, the Bible says, guess how David dealt with the fact that a brother raised a sister. It says, and David was very angry. And as passive as David was, David could read great soldiers. He could not read great sons. The Bible says the next verse. Verse 22. And Absalom spoke to his brother. And Absalom spoke to, spoke to his brother Amnon. Neither good nor bad. Why didn't he talk? The anger. The pain was brewing. The pain was brewing. The pain was brewing. And the reason why the pain was even brewing for me was that Tamar was living in his house. So every time he sees Tamar, if you want to cut off baggage, cut off the sauce. A 
If you want to cut up baguette, do what? Cut up the sauce. The pain was brewing. See, see what the Bible says. And because, why? It says, and Absalom, although he wasn't talking, he hated Amnon. And the Bible says this, because he forced his sister Tamar. And the next thing, see, see, see verse 23. And it came to pass after two years, and that's what I'm going to. After two years. For two years, he didn't do anything. Well, but after two years, I'll tell you the rest of the story. After two years, what eventually happened was this. What eventually happened was this. This, this amazing happened after two years. After two years, Absalom invited all the king's sons. And when he invited all the king's sons, <laughs> it was for a dinner. You know what Absalom did? He single-handedly killed all of them. Why? The pain, it says, if my father wouldn't talk, he killed all of them. He didn't stop there. You know, he, he erected an open large tent in Israel. He invited all his David's wife. He began to sleep with David's wife in the open. Just imagine what pain can do to someone. I don't think Absalom was a bad person. I just think pain made him a bad person. And, and the reason I'm saying so is this, and this back to the teaching, and the reason I'm saying this, this, this is very important to all of us to know. When you see a marriage malfunction, Sometimes it's good to point and maybe she's not a great person or he's not a great person. And that could be true. But sometimes there's deep-rooted pain that people go through. In, in, in the service before this, one lady spoke and I'm gonna, we're going to share together. And one lady spoke and said, I'm a single mom. I got pregnant at 22. I'm now, I think she's about maybe 29 or so. He said, Three years ago, I discovered that my stepbrother had come to the house and raped my daughter. And when she was about four years old. He said, what broke my heart was the most was that my family members tried to keep it as a family issue. I took the police station. Eventually, they knocked, they used their power to knock out the issue for the police station. He said, I was surprised how my family would defend a stepbrother that raped my daughter over me. But that's what happened. He said, but guess what right now? He said, that my stepbrother that raped my daughter is very sick and is almost on his way to death. He said, he's looking for help. I have the power to help him. He said, but I don't feel anything for him. He said, I'm a very compassionate lady. He said, but I cannot find myself helping him, even though I can help him. And I said, that's what pain has done to you. What pain has done to you, that pain will limit your potentials. For Absalom, Absalom will have become the next king instead of Solomon. But because of pain, because of pain. The reason why is that a lot of you say to yourself, I don't know how to love. I don't know how to do this. I can't give this to a man. You can do it. It's your, this was not how you were before. Should I tell you the truth? I was said this the other service. I said, most of you here, the person that really enjoyed you was your first boyfriend or your first girlfriend. By the time your husband or your new boyfriend came along the way, you were already second hand to Kumbo. Because, because the can, can I get my boxes? Because with the relationship, with each relationship came a baggage. With each, with each relationship came a baggage. So when you were young, you just pull out the boxes here. You know, when you when you when you were young, I, I'm trying to get someone to you know, yeah, Wally, will you come? You know, when you were young, this is how you loved. There was no baggage in your hands. This was how you loved. You you saw a wonderful lady and you fell in love. Oh wow, nothing. You just fell in love. I love you. You, you give all your heart to it. But as you dated, what's the first guy's name now? Femi. Femi. You know, Femi broke up with you and left you a baggage. I don't know who Femi is. And the second guy's name now? Kaya, they, they broke up with you and left another baggage. And, and what, what other person's name now? Chinedu, Chinedu broke up with you. And the other person right now? Ebuka and e Ebuka broke up with you. Thank you, thank you. You know, and Ebuka broke up with you. And, and now you meet this person that wants to marry you. And you come to this relationship and hug me. They hug you, but you can give back because there's a lot that you are carrying. There's a lot. There's a lot of rejection and self-esteem problem and self-love problem and evaluation problem and you're like this and this is how you're going all the time. But this is a baggage. And, and, and you're saying that I want to love you 
but I'm finding it difficult because there is the baggage. I know we're married. I know we're married, but I'm finding it difficult to give the whole of myself to you because there are things I'm holding on to as baggage. So it's just difficult for me. So in your heart, you will plan on how your next relationship, you will give all your best to it. How your next marriage, you will give all your best to it. For you to just enter and you'll find that you have the same person and you just keep going around in the cycle. And you see what's happening to me and what is happening to you is that there are baggages. There are baggages. There are baggages. There. Glory to God. Why is it important to fix baggage? Let me show you what baggage is to do. Can you me arrange the bags? Yeah. Let's put this here. Thank you. And come. Thank you, Wally. You can go. And this is why it's going to fill your package. Because what you do most of the time is this. You take your baggage and you hide behind your baggage. Have you seen people that are very lovely, but you have to enter inside? Where, where are they? If you know you're like that, wave. You, 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 know, you know, from the outside, they seem tough. They seem harsh. They seem so defensive. On the inside, they are soft, they are sweet, but on the outside, hi, hi. <laughs> but the reason why is this because what they've done with their baggage that they've used their baggage to build what a defense. And many of them that single wonder why am I delayed? Because when men come to you, they don't see you, or they see your baggage, and nobody wants to marry your baggage. And when girls see you, they say, but I'm a very sweet person. We don't see your sweetness, all we see is the baggage. Because over time, you've gotten so comfortable with your baggage. Now you hide yourself behind the baggage. And you'll be lucky sometimes to find a man that, or a woman that can persist to break through that baggage until they find you. But most times, people are not that patient. So as soon as you do that, they move on. And you wonder... Why am I single? You're single because we can't see you. All we can see is your baggage. And, 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 and if you think that's wrong, I want to turn to First Samuel and look at the story. And look at the story of Saul and what Saul did with his own baggage. I want us to see this. What Saul did with his own baggage. First Samuel chapter 11. Glory to God. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 22, the message translation. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 22, the message translation. I, I want to show you. So, Saul also had baggage. And when God was looking for Saul, you know what God said? God said, I can find him, but you can find him because he's hiding in between the baggages. See what the Bible says here. So, Samuel went back to God and said, Where is he looking for Saul? Is he anywhere around here? And God said, Yes, he's there. He's over there hidden in what? So what Saul was hiding in the pile of baggage. And what does your baggage look like? No self-love. Because, because I told you my story. You know, I, I told you my story. And let me say something to you. When we tell the stories about how our background affects us, someone that is not very holistic in his thinking could think that I can hold my parents for my fault for the things that happened to me. I understand what you said, but you must understand that your parents also has issues. I'm telling you, you're also growing up. You're going to have kids. It's when you're young, you think your parents had it together. You know, I thought when I was young, my father could buy anything. But as I grew older, I knew of his limitations. Sometimes, what your mom did, it was just the best they could. I, I was hearing a story. I was hearing a story of this man that was telling me something. He said, he, he, he said he, he, oh my God. I, and I, this story is just over. It's actually a girl. It's over here. Just in VR here. Just in VR here. And the lady, the, the lady, till today, she's not married. And you know why? The, she's a single mom. My mother has one child. Every time a mom's boyfriend comes to the house, a mom will push out of the house. 
and they have done that since that girl was about seven years old. So imagine how that guy, girl processes marriage. Imagine just down the road here. Imagine so so marriage is that thing that makes you not have time. So she will just be locked outside. They say, "Go on." They will give her an everlasting punish, um, what do they call it punishment errand. They say, uh, "Go and do this. Go and do this. Go and do this." And she will be there for hours when she's back because they will not open the door. And you know what she told her? It was a story of self rejection. That if my mother can push me out for a man, who else can love me? I, I mean, you, you heard, I'm not sure if it was Wednesday or when the lady was sharing. She said, she said, she said, she's almost 30. And um, she said, I struggle with the thought of marriage and relationships. He said, The reason why I struggle with it is this. I've not spoken to my father in seven years. And the reason why is that I literally saw my father box my mom until my mom had a brain tumor. And my mom eventually died of that brain tumor. And someone talks about marriage. You want to kill me? But the challenge, let me tell you what the challenge is. The challenge is that that lady's about 30 right now. She's not taking it serious. Then she's going to get to 40 and be like, you know what? All our friends are married. Then it will dawn on her that, oh, wow. You cannot define your future based on what has happened in the past. And she will now try to fix it at 40. And that age can be challenging to get married. And what is happening is that she's just leaving and defining the future with the baggage. And you know what God does with the baggage? God doesn't break your baggage. All he does is to invite you to bring your baggage. What does he say? Stand my brother. He says, come to me, all ye that heavy laden. He says, you must carry your baggage. Bring the baggage. He says, you must carry your baggage and bring it to me. Then I will take it here. Because Calvary is a place where we take baggages to. Bring the baggage. Bring the baggage. See, God is, God is not going to force. God is not going to force you. He, but you, with your hand, have to bring that baggage and bring it to him. And someone says, how do I know if I have baggage? The first thing are people that deny it. How do you know people that deny their baggages? They are never in touch with their feelings. I'm a master of it. That's how I was born. That's how I dealt with it. That's what religion taught me. That's what church taught me. Church taught me to deny my feelings. God tells me to not live by my feelings, to live by faith. He didn't say, he says, we walk by faith, not by sight. He didn't ask me to deny them. He just said, let your faith supersede your feelings. So when I was dating my wife, my wife asked me, what do you want for marriage? I said, nothing. He said, how do you want to be loved? I said, I don't know. And sincerely, I did not know because I was not raised in a loving home. Love was very foreign to me. And he told me to deny I had the problem. All I did was speak in tongues. And many of us are here. You, you've not dealt with it. You've not dealt, you've not dealt with these issues. I, I'm the kid. I'm that kind of kid that I have no memory that my father ever carried me up in his hands. I don't have the memory. I have no single memory. That my father ever carried me up in his hands and threw me up in his hands. There's no memory of that in my life. And some of you here, you could have a father's wound that the father was absent. And that's why some of you are attracted to older men. You're not looking for a husband, you're looking for a father. You, 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 you just don't know. So when you follow these people in their 50s and 60s and you say, I'm really attracted to older men. The real truth is this, the father that was not there, that's what you're looking for. When you see someone that is notorious for sleeping around, as much as you want to think that she's loose, it's not a body that is loose, it's a mind that is loose. Because something fundamentally has gone on in the mind. Have you seen people that... that there's a, I almost mentioned her name, I can't do that. <laughs> These videos go really viral. There's a girl I used to know. They brought her to me when her boyfriend broke up with her. She was just about 22. And when they brought her to me, I saw marks all over her hands. I said, what is this? She was cutting herself because someone 
broke up with her. You know, I was quick to know that it's not about this guy that broke up with her. There's something in your history that is making you interpret this thing like this way. There are many of you, you've been left alone for so long that you've been left alone for so long and so frequently. When someone leaves you alone, it triggers something. That's a trigger. And when you eventually become married, there is an, there is an over-attachment. There's an over-attachment. There is an over-attachment because, because it's almost as if they want to leave me. It's almost as if they want to leave me. Almost as if they want to leave me. Why do you think that way? And that becomes the weapon for Satan to use. Do you know something? The rape of Tama ruined Absalom forever. Will you allow your pain to ruin you or you are going to fix it? Why is it important? Thank you, sir. Why, why is it important to fix your pain? The first reason is this. Because like Absalom, it will limit your potentials. The second thing is this. Because your pain, where's my painting? Yeah. Mix it, paint it, and give it to me. Because your pain will stain your perspective. Your pain. So, when you hear people that have pain, you don't have to sit in the hospital to hear them. Just listen to them. You can hear it. Because your pain will stain your perspective. Then the third thing your pain will do is this. Your pain would... Oh, this is very powerful. Your pain will make you... Your hurt and pain will make you hurt those that you love and those that love you can you come can you come with that quickly this is good have you painted i just need all of this on my hands yeah this is it i'm bleeding i'm bleeding somewhere but guess who feels it? Let me show you who feels it. Let, let, let me call someone over there. Yeah, come, come, my brother. Let me tell you who coming. So, people on the outside can't know I'm bleeding because they are too far. But people that are close by, because they are close, when they come close, I put it on them. I put my pain. Yeah, let, 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 what, what else that, do I need to put the pain on? Come, 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 come. Yeah, 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 come. Come. Yeah. You know, I can't put it on you. are not close enough. Because on, that's why people think you're sweet until they know you. Come, give me some pain again. That's why sometimes when you complain about your wife, people say, is it your wife you're talking about? When you talk about your husband, you say, is it your husband? Is it that your boyfriend that is so sweet? Because you are too far away to see we that see know that we have been stained because when you're hurt the people you pass the hurts to the most are those you love and those that love you and is it not amazing what reputation do you have to be the person that will love those that love you or the person that hurts those that love you and when you keep doing this, this is, this is how we are facing a single person. Once you keep doing this, then the people that love you keep going away from your life. Because everyone has a threshold of how much they can receive. Everyone has a threshold on how much they can contain. And you feel no one likes you, but you are with your hands pushing them away from you. And when you push everybody that can really love you away, then you now have functional relationships that you want to love, but they're parasites. And they begin to confirm your opinion of relationship. And that thought now becomes a stronghold. You now say things like, all men are useless. Because the ones that were not useless you stained them and stained them. But the ones that stayed are the ones that know how to manage your trauma because they also have trauma. Native sabiti pass. So you steal from me, I steal from you. You go for me, I go for you. And that's the world you love living.
Glory to God. And, and, and the pain can be as much as neglect. One of the guys was telling me, he said, when you preached in the second service, I broke down and cried because I've never met my father before I'm in my 30s. He said, my mother told me my father left in all six months. He said, but the cry was the cry that all the pain I've, I've had for him and against him, I release it. See, you need to understand something. If you hold on to your pain, you damage yourself more than the person. But the reason why we hold to our pain is that it's our safe place. We've mastered how to hide. We've mastered, we've mastered how to hide. Because to heal you will cost you some pain. But it's temporary pain for permanent freedom. But it's safer to hide. So you never want to talk any, you never you never want to deal with the fact that you were raped. You never you, as a matter of fact, what you want to do is to deny it. So the thing about pain is this: so you keep hurting all the people that really love you. Because it's hurt you have, it's hurt you give. And all of a sudden you marry someone, and the person is the consequence of your pain. And in, the, in one of the services, one lady was over there. And you can watch the service. And the lady said, the fact that I came with my husband to this service is a miracle already. He said, just for you to know, my husband did something. And I find it so hard to... He said, I've forgiven him. And I said, lady, you've not forgiven him. And I understand what you mean. Is that forgiving him? I, I said, maybe you were forced to forgive him because there's a term you need to understand. It's called forced forgiveness. Forced forgiveness is when you are told, forgive him, is your husband. I understand what they mean. But the way forgiveness is, it has to be voluntarily released. You can compel me to forgive. And when I forgive, I must have the time to be able to recover through that process. But when you force me, you deny me that process to just heal. And that lady, and the husband, I didn't know the husband was with her. I said, the husband is beside me. And as she was talking, she was crying. And the husband tried to touch him. He said, Pastor, tell him not to touch me. He said, because I'm not there. He said, the reason I'm crying out is this. And this is, what, this is why I'm sharing the story. He said, the reason I'm crying out is this. He's been trying to touch me for six months. And I said, don't touch me. And I push away. He said, but the challenge for me is that our three-year-old son has noticed this. So when daddy wants to carry him, he said, daddy, don't touch me. And he pushes away. The last reason why you want to treat your pain is this. If you don't treat it, you'll pass it down to your children. And what a lot of Pentecostals call generational curses is hurt and pain that have been passed down to sons and daughters. So as they inherited your son name, they carried your pain, they carried your shame. You know why you, know why you must treat your pain? Because when you, when you don't treat your pain in a marriage or in a relationship, you go have unrealistic expectation. You will just think this is how the world is because pain stains your perspective. So it's so difficult to have a conversation. So I, I, there's a lady I said, your husband, I, I mean, cancer so many your husband said you struggle with sex. And, um, you know, and they've gone to all the marriage cancer and they will tell her, um, when you want to do sex, do this, do this. You know, but I always know more than that. I always know the deep reason. I said, so why do you struggle with sex? And she said, you know, I'm not just a sex person. I'm not a morning person. And I, she answered, I said, that's fine. So why do you struggle with sex? And she gave me another day. I'll say, that's fine. So why do you struggle with sex? And she, you know, and if you know me very well, I still have my question. She said, okay, 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 okay. I'd say when I was raped, I said, I figured. He said, I said, so the first memory of sex you have is someone stole from you, someone defiled you, someone hurt you. And because, so this is what happens when you have pain, you carry shame sometimes. So because she carries that shame when she enters into the sexual position, because shame is not a place of comfort, she has to disassociate herself in the experience. So the husband is sleeping with the body, but her spirit and soul is not there. And so it can be enjoyable. So
So th this is very powerful for us today. So the reason why you want to, because so, so all of a sudden, she wants her husband to understand where she is sexually and meet her at that place. But it's difficult to meet her at that place because her sexual expectations are not realistic because of there's a dark thing that nobody knows. She understands why she's like that, but she can't say it. Have you not seen women that says, ha, huh, no man, because I should not walk. No man. And you wonder, but you don't even have a boyfriend. Is it just in advance? I'm just saying this in advance. And the reason why is that they grew up from a home where the father used financial power to manipulate the mother to doing things that she should never or would want to do. And because of that, they made up their mind. Glory to God. Thank you. I said glory to God. Just before I come to the concluding part, I want to, I want to open the microphone. I, and I want us to share stories of the kinds of pains you went through and how it's affecting you. Because we just want to be open. To, we want to be open today, right? Yeah. And, and whatever we stay here stays here. It stays, it, stays, it stays within us. But it's going online, right? It stays online. Amen. So I want to ask you a question. Where are people that want to share from their personal experience? Maybe you've dealt with it. Maybe you're struggling with it. Maybe you have a question. Just raise up your hands. I'd love to call on you. Just raise up your hands quickly. I just want three, four people to do that. Just raise up your hands. Thank you, my sister. Just give her the microphone. Thank you, my sister over here. Let's appreciate them. Just give her the microphone. And, 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 and please, I want to respect the moment because sometimes the story gets really tough. It gets vulnerable. But you need to understand where they're coming from. And these people are just sincerely saying stories where they're looking for help. This lady on my right first. On first. Just first. She raised up her hand first. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, when I was growing up, I saw my dad always hitting my mom to the point that she, she fainted one time and I thought she was dead. My dad went... How old went, were you when that happened? I was... Just um, play part. I don't want to play a song. I was no. like eight, nine, there about. Okay. Yeah. So my dad was actually doing very well when he was working and he was working he was making money but he didn't when you see him when people see him outside they're like oh this man is taking care of the children take care of the family but he doesn't drop anything in the house and my mom didn't go to school as her then so she had to push herself to school while in the marriage so he was always tormenting my mom so she had to push herself to school. She saw herself How did that school. make you feel as a child seeing that? I felt, I don't know, but I, I really, I didn't like my dad. I didn't like him up to now. Up to now? Yeah, do, so. You, you, when you see him now, do you, do you struggle? Sorry? Do you, when you see him now, do you struggle? Well, right now, he's not doing anything. I lost his job some years back. And, and, and you find it hard to help him, and right? I can't, I can't even help him. I can't help him. Uh, you, you can't help and him because you are a mean person, or it's just difficult to help it's him. It's difficult it? because he didn't, didn't. When I when I had issues with school, he was like, um, "I'm done with you." Even my siblings go and sell tomatoes or something. So my mom was the one that was like, "No, you have to keep trying and all that." So finally, she got herself a job. Can, can I? Talk, I just want to help to to cut the stories. You know, just ask you direct questions. How does this impact how you see men, how you see fathers from a very sincere place? I wouldn't say all men are the same though, but I still believe there are good men out there. But how does it impact how you see men? So the primary way you see men is like my potential father, son. When you date, do you struggle to trust? Yes, I do. How did I know that from where she's coming from? And sorry, one last yeah. 
I had a dream today about my dad because he's doing nothing and my mom is not helping him. The house we're living, my mom built it. So the issue is, is it that he lives or do you understand? So I had a dream that he died, he was in his room. They didn't know until days later. So I, I woke up this morning and I, I just couldn't pray for him. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And, and it's good for you to, but, but that's the depth. When I said the hurt will turn you into who you're not. And the reason why she has to fix it is this. Two reasons why she must fix it. Number one, if she's not careful, that mentality will make her attract such a man to her life. Because as a man thinks it in his heart, so is he. Now the second thing is this, it will become a cycle for our children. But that's what we're here. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Who, who else is sharing Thank you for sharing that. What else is sharing? Just raise up your hands. Let me see. Yeah. There's someone at the far back that you come to the lady over here. You, you can come to the lady over here. I can, yeah. You can come to the lady over here. The, the lady with the, with the cap. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, when I was three months old, was. When you were when three I, months old? Yes, when, when I lost my dad. And. Um, I never had parental care. You never had what? Parental care. Wow. So. What happened to your mom? It was epic for her. Like, we were three, and um, at the end of the day, our first child, she lost our first child, and it was just me, my brother, and she got remarried, and um, the compound we stay in, so there was this family that I loved their son so much. So I started living with them, actually left, live with them for, since when I was 10 years old till date. But there was a lot. Um, the man actually, okay, just take your time. Take your time. Uh, it was one that was virgin. What did he say? It was the one that disparaged me. And um, that's not been this. I want to notice this lady's pain because some of the pain is our father died. That's not even anybody's fault. So it's, a, it's like there's a very popular celebrity that, you know, I mean, she might be here right now that I help. And I just said, why are you not dating? Why do you run? He said, my father died when I needed him the most. I feel as if men will always leave me. Because every pain comes with a belief. And that's what, when you get healed, what God does is to change the perspective. So that you can know that what well, the enemy thought for evil, God has turned around to good. But before you can say that, there needs to be a fundamental change in belief system. Are you dating? No. Of course, how will she be dating? See, so this kind of person now, she's going to say I'm delayed. But it's not delayed now. It's the fact that there are just many obstacles. And what we Pentecostals want to do is to speak in tongues over it. Listen, we just put putting salt on spot food. What we need. So, so how do we get, and I'm going to show you a scripture from Psalms. Give, give the last lady over there. You know, I don't know if there's a guy that raised up their hand, but I think I saw someone over there, you know, at the far back, right? And, wow. And, and, and let me just turn to Hebrews chapter 12. If you, she can start speaking as soon as she has a microphone. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I'm not really composed right now, but mine is a bit, I won't say pathetic, but 
I, I didn't grow up with my father. Like, okay, sorry, I have to stand up. Okay. I knew my father while I was 16. I grew up with my paternal mom. My mom remarried. I was struggling. But the point is, I was never loved by anyone. That's just it. Well, why did you think you were never loved by anyone? Tell, tell because, me what that yeah. Okay. My father came back when I needed him the most. That was school. But it was just like he was never there because the only thing he did was he felt maybe paying the school fee was just going to erase the old memory that he was not there while I was younger. So it got to a state that, okay, I went to school and I studied law and the only thing that comes to my mind is I'm going to sue this man. Even till now, I tell him face to face that, man, forget it, we're going to court. And whenever he calls me, the first thing he says, Mark back with where I don't lock out so the thing is, it got to a state that, like you said, yes, I was growing up to, to look at other people, you know, getting attracted to older people, looking at, what will I say? Did you notice that? So she was, now, what was the age you were looking at? Tell me the age, people, when you were in your 20s or maybe 18, what, what, what age were you attracted to? Let, let me say right from this fact that it came, like the fact, the period it came, I was attracted to them just because I think... I, I, I want somebody to love me and take care of me. The exactly. See, see, this is the thing. Because many of you, the problem is what is even pushing you into relationship is wrong. Because you think you're looking for love, but that's how you interpret it. What is really happening to you is this. This is what's really happening to you. That there is something that you're missing from your childhood that you're looking for. And that thing would eventually push you to the wrong place. I remember a mother telling me about this child of hers. She was 22 and was dating this older person that was 56 or so. And, he said, and the mother said, what did I do to God? And the first question I asked, was her father present? He said, no. I said, she's looking for her. And this is the same reason in, in America, you will see a large number of the black race have gone to prison because their fathers were not there. Because the father is a stabilizing factor in the home. Just say the last thing. How has this impacted you the most? I really can't say because the point is, I don't know if I'm getting it right in life or I, I don't know. I just know I'm struggling because the point is, my mom is not fine where she is. I'm the first child from both family and I'm trying to be the best just to make my mom happy and myself. Even in my past relationship, it was looking like, I was being bossy, I was controlling, I, was, but I wasn't getting satisfied because it was like I was looking for something I'm still not getting. Mm. So even till now, I still find, I don't know, it's just like I'm lost. You know, sister, you're on the right path. And, and I'll tell you why you're on the right path. I'll, I'll tell you why you're on the right path. Because you are identifying things. When you want to solve a problem, you have to define it. A problem that cannot be defined cannot be solved. So the moment you identify that I'm looking for something, just put it as a box. And you need to keep searching. The second thing is this. That, okay, okay, I'm bossy. So why am I bossy? Because nobody was there to guide me, lead me. I've taken charge of my life myself. But there's a problem for that because if you're too strong, sometimes as a leader, sometimes you can repel a lot of men. Because sometimes the women are built to look for a woman they can support. So you're on the right track. And that's what I'm going to conclude with today. Psalm 147, verse 3. Uh, does anybody want to say, did you miss a guy? Did, did, we, did the man have to talk? Did you miss another lady's perspective? I know there are a lot of hands up, but, you know, we can just keep going. All right. I, I, I mean, there's one more, but um, maybe we'll just... Do you, you, you really need to share your perspective? You really need to? The lady at the back? You need to? Okay. Come, come, and, come, 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 come to the front. There's a lady in black over here. Come, come to the front, middle. Yeah, there's a lady in black over here. I, I want to hear your story. You can sit down. It's okay. You don't have to stand up. Yeah. I've not said this before. It's just been inside me. 
I was this virgin by my sister's husband. So I've not really said anything to anybody. I just always keep it inside of me and it kills me every day. Even when I told my mom and my sister one time she caught it when the man was trying to touch me and all. So I thought that was the end of my marriage, but I don't know. They were able to talk it out. Then they told me to go and stay with her. Like, why would you tell me to stay with somebody that wasn't they, they, they told, watch this now. They told you. She was pregnant for a second child. So they moved out, out of where we our area. So they moved somewhere else. So they said they needed somebody that would stay with her. Then my mom told me to go. I was I And that person to had to be you. Because I was the last person. So, so, so let me tell you what the pain is. The pain, the pain is multiple. Number one, it's not just what this man did to me. The pain is I tell my mom, they deny it. Then the third thing is that they now send me. So there's rejection, there's abuse. Then every night, he will always come and try to touch me. I would cry and cry and tell him not to, but he just had to do what he was to do. I felt bad every time. There was one time I ran away from their house, I went back home. My mom took me back there. <laughs> I didn't even know what to do. Like, what the f- was happening? Since then, I just bottled it in my mind. Like, okay, I've been keeping it. Like, I haven't said anything to anybody about it until now. It's been a whole lot. I don't even know. Like, I don't know what to do. My, 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 my friend, I, I want to say something to you. Okay, can you stand? I, I, I would love to help you. I, I want to look at something. Psalm 147 verse 3. I want to look at this. So firstly, you don't stay with them again, right? That's good. Th- this has affected, how has this affected you? aggressive like yeah. I don't like to be in an enclosed space with a man alone because I feel that he wants to touch me so I'm always very defensive my friend says you're always defensive you're always aggressive yes I have so, to be. so people I told you what opposed the baggage people see the baggage but they don't see the person so they define her by all these things not what she is but we're about to take care of that right now we're about to fix that by the power of the Holy Spirit I want you to close your eyes. And there's a, there's a deep walk of grace. And after this, you'll be free. The Bible says he heals the brokenhearted. And this is, what ha- this is the first thing I want you to see. I want you to see an angel coming from heaven. An angel of the Lord. And the angel is coming to you. And the angel opens this big box. And it reaches down on the inside of you. And it begins to take out the pain. And as it takes out the pain, all of the memories of all the rape and all the abuse, all the nights, they come and you're upset and you're angry and all of those things. And the angel of God is pulling it out of you. And it's really painful, but he's pulling it out of you. And he's pulling it out from this very root because this is a supernatural operation of God. And it's been a process of time and he's pulling this out. And the angel of God looks through you and there's nothing. Then the angel of God closes that box. Yeah, and I understand the tears because this is what you've experienced, and it's closing, it's shutting, it, it's taking, it's it's it's, 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 it's that files is closing all of those things, it's closing it. 
and it carries that box and throws it into hell that burns with fire and all of a sudden all of those memories begins to melt away melt away so much so that you're feeling light but it doesn't just do that but it's also an angel of good news and it's bringing you good news right now and in that place he brings you love he brings you joy I, I wanted to see you bringing you joy bringing you love I wanted to see yourself all of a sudden you're free from this past you're stripped of the past I wanted to say to yourself I'm free from this past I wanted to say I'm free from this past and it's bringing you joy and love and assurance not just that in this package is a man that all of a sudden you find yourself comfortable with that you can love that he's not hurting you is only loving you and you are in enclosed spaces and instead of him instead of you to see hurt all you see is love and protection and you're saying to yourself i've never expressed something like this before and the spirit of god just working through you say with me i receive your love oh god i receive your love oh god the past is gone my future is bright full of love and hope in Christ Jesus lady I want to read this read this for me he let the broken the broken in the heart yeah. and binded up their wounds that's what has happened to you right now What, when I was busy moving into that process, what did you sense God was doing in you? A lot of things. What? A lot of things. A lot of things. And that's because the old is woven wiped away and the new is coming new. Let me tell you something. Ever look at me. The way God changes your future is to bring new pictures into it. The way the devil destroys your picture is to bring the past as your future. The devil, you know what the devil does? It takes the past and brings into your future. Then you repeat the past again. But when God was in your future, so Jesus met Peter and said, I will change your name. Why? I want to change your future. He met Abraham. He says, you are no longer Abraham. You are now Abraham. I want to change your future. So how do you fix this? The first way is this. Identify the pattern. You must, that's why you must pay attention to yourself. That's the only way. That's the only thing I'm going to say today. I, I, I want to. I want to end with the scripture. I don't want to. There's a lot of steps, but I want to leave you on a faith field level. And this is what the Bible says. He said, "He, he let the brokenhearted." So I don't want to ever think as if my case is beyond. God says, "I'm committing to healing the broken in heart." Then some of you feel as if once I've been opened, He says, "I bind up their wounds." Bind up their wounds. It doesn't matter how deep the wound is. God says, I. We didn't ask him, he promised on his word. I bind up the wounds. So, if you know that the first thing you have to do is to identify what wound needs to be bound up. What broken heart needs to be healed. The reason why is this. You can never change what you deny. You can what? You can never change what you deny. And let me tell you what you're going to do today in a simple way. We're going to come back next week and finish this up. Or maybe during the reading service. I hope I have all the time. And you're going to pray. We're going to pray today and say, Lord, heal. Then after you say, Lord, heal from this evening, you'll start reciting this in thanksgiving. Father, thank you for healing broken hearts and binding up wounds. Let's stand up and pray.